<laughs> and there. Oh, there we go. Okay. So um, as mentioned today, we have Rebecca Short. Uh, she is the Irrigation Water Quantity Engineer with OMAFRA. Her role with the ministry involves helping Ontario producers improve their production by providing irrigation and water management expertise to the province. Rebecca is the co-author of many OMAFRA irrigation publications, including the Irrigation Best Management Practices book. And most recently, she's developed demonstrations on water efficiency and soil moisture monitoring. Her specialty includes water permitting and drip irrigation. And some of you may have talked with Rebecca in the past about your permit to draw water, um, as well as potentially sizing your irrigation systems for your hop yards. Uh, Rebecca holds an MSc and a BSc from McGill University in Agricultural Engineering, and she's been active in water and irrigation associations across Canada and the US. Uh, we've provided some of Rebecca's uh, links to information in the posting on uh, the On Specialty Crops blog, and I think Rebecca will be directing you to some of that in her presentation today. So please welcome Rebecca. And I am going to stop sharing my screen, hopefully. <laughs> okay, and... All right, so you guys can see the full screen. Evan, it looks good. Sorry, no, you're in uh, presentation Present mode. Presenter mode? Yeah, sorry, presenter mode. Better? There you go, yep, that looks good. Okay, great. All right, so welcome everybody. Um, we actually have a relatively small group. So if you do have a burning question or something you don't understand, um, uh, feel free to ask or, or put it in the chat and if and Evan could uh, maybe stick handle a bit of that. But I do want to make sure people understand. We're gonna be really breezing through quickly. Um, so I'm gonna talk about evapotranspiration and how to calculate what your hop plant water demands are, and then the corresponding runtime for drip irrigation. We are going to talk about soil moisture monitoring, and I don't think we're going to get to talking about irrigation system monitoring today. There's just not quite enough time, but um, we'll see how we go, how we do. So um, this presentation is uh, from the olden days when it used to be in person and interactive, and I would ask people, where, where does our irrigation or rainwater go? Uh, when it comes onto our farms. And so there's a couple of places where it can go. Uh, one is transpiration. That's where we hope a lot of the irrigation or rainwater is going. So into the roots of the plant and up through the leaves and transpired into the atmosphere. Can also be evaporated and uh, from the surface, either the surface of the soil or the surface of the leaves. The water can go and stay into our soil in the root zone. So that's a change in soil moisture. And that's another good place where we like the water to go. Uh, if we get a heavy rainfall or if we put on a lot of irrigation, then we can get deep percolation. So water moving below our root zone. And if the rainfall comes very heavy, then we can also get runoff. So ideally, we want to maximize our water going to transpiration and perhaps change in the soil moisture. We definitely want to avoid runoff. And I understand from Evan, most people are using drip irrigation. So it'd be very unusual to have runoff. We want to avoid too heavy of irrigation. So we want to avoid deep percolation. And with drip, we're doing a lot of work to avoid that evaporation portion. So how to know what our plant water demand is? The plant water demand is basically a combination of the water that gets transpired through the plant and also the unavoidable evaporation. Even with drip, we're gonna have some evaporation. And that those two together are called evapotranspiration or ET for short. And so you'll hear me in this presentation refer a lot to ET, which is the evapotranspiration. So that's what our our plant water demand is. 
So another question, what drives ET or evapotranspiration? And uh, there's a number of things that drive ET. And if you guessed any of these, you would be right. It is driven by the temperature, solar radiation, wind, and relative humidity. In Ontario, our um, summers, we don't have as high of evapotranspiration as some other more commonly irrigated areas because our relative humidity tends to be fairly high. And um, there are exceptions. So if I think of 2016, uh, was a really dry summer and we also had a lot of wind and we had very low humidity, which is very unusual in Ontario. Normally our summers when it gets hot, it is oppressive for people because we are very sticky. That's not so bad for plants. When we have those um, lower humidity days, when we feel great relaxing in the shade with a, maybe a cool drink, um, that's, that's when it's really difficult on the plants because it's very desiccating. Um, so evapotranspiration is a combination of these climatic conditions. Uh, you might say, well, what about soils? Um, if you have a soil that has very little water, then the actual amount of, uh, of uh, moisture that the plant will transpire will be less because there's not water available. But your, your potential for evapotranspiration is driven just by climatic factors. So how can we know what the evapotranspiration is at our location for our plants? And so uh, one of the more common ways is to use a weather station to calculate the evapotranspiration from those climatic uh, parameters. So very common to have a weather station measuring temperature. It's somewhat unusual to measure solar radiation and it is possible to estimate the solar radiation, which is very common. And then we need to also measure relative humidity and wind speed. Another way is to use an instrument called an atmometer. So the atmometer is basically a column of water uh, with a porous ceramic tip here at the top. And as uh, the sun and the temperature is beating down on this ceramic tip, moisture is drawn out from that um, column. And you can see on the side of the atmometer how much the water drops on each day. Um, they can also be automated. These instruments are, um, about $1,000. Uh, classic way to measure evapotranspiration would be using a class A evaporation pan. Environment Canada used to operate evaporation pans, but I don't believe there are any in operation any longer at any of the Environment Canada stations. Um, you can uh, operate yourself uh, what I call the class B wash tub. Um, the screen is just to avoid horses or children playing or drinking in it. You want to fill it right up near the top. If the water level starts to get down, then you get shading of that water surface and you won't see the actual uh, true uh, evapotranspiration of the decrease of the water height. It's a little bit tricky to measure the daily losses, but if you have a ruler taped to the inside of your wash tub, you can certainly see over the week how much water has uh, evaporated. And that can be used as a, um, your number for the potential evapotranspiration. Uh, you'll see in this picture, also there's a rain gauge. So when it rains, we know how much uh, water came into the tub as opposed to how much is being trans uh, evaporated. The other place which I recommend is uh, maybe more than those instruments, is to use web data. So here are two websites. One is onpotatoes.ca, which has a couple of stations across Ontario where they're, uh, well, they're just in southern, southwestern Ontario, where they're calculating ET from weather station data. And the other is farmwest.com. And also our Irrigation Best Management Practices book, page 45, has historic uh, data which can be used to um, historic averages, which can be used to for calculating purposes in general. So let's take a look at FarmWest. So when you come to farmwest.com, it's actually operated by BC farmers. So when you start, you'll get stuff in BC. So you can either click here on climate and then you'll get evapotranspiration or you can click on this square. And then we'll click here to select our province of Ontario. We click for regions in Ontario. And then it's taking data from the Environment Canada weather stations. 
a selection of them. And so in this example, I just clicked Vineland Station and I selected the first 12 days of May. And then you, I always click here, not cumulative and go. So this is what we get. It shows what the um, evaporation, evapotranspiration was over that period that I selected. So the first 12 days of May, cause I put this slide deck together last week. Um, the average daily, how much precipitation there was. So there was no precipitation in Vineland. Um, the moisture deficit um, and uh, sorry, there was precipitation, but we considered that none of it was effective because it was very small. And um, it also gives you a forecast evapotranspiration. So here it's saying we expect that uh, tomorrow, well, this was last week, so the next day would be three millimeters, about three millimeters each day. Um, in fact, Saturday and Sunday, I just looked it up, were a bit higher. They were I think 4.3 and uh, 4.9 millimeters. So um, quite a bit higher evapotranspiration than what was being forecast last week. When you scroll down, you get a nice graph. And the cool thing is you get the daily um, amounts uh, in the yellow and then the green is your historical average. So you can see that last week, our evapotranspiration was a little bit below average. Um, and then this week, I anticipate that we'll be a little bit above average. And we also get a graph of the rainfall. So you can see there was a tiny bit of rain in those first days of May in Vineland, three millimeters, one millimeter, and two millimeters. So pretty negligible. Anything below five millimeters is, is pretty much negligible. Um, so if you're going to write something down, um, write down this website, www.farmwest.com. And then, like I said, you click through for ET and then find your closest weather station. Um, the ET data is valid over a wide area. Typically, I would say if you have a station in your county, that's going to be totally fine. Precipitation? No, you have to measure that on site. Evapotranspiration is good countywide, approximately. <clears throat> so for the purpose of our discussion today, <clears throat> We're going to um, calculate the peak evapotranspiration for hops um, for the hottest week of the summer. And this is what we want to be sure that our irrigation system can supply. And it gives us a sense about how we need to operate our system for that peak week, the hottest week. And so for most of southwestern Ontario, so let's say north shore of Lake Erie, um, I would say a good number is that five millimeters per day is our hottest week of the summer about. There'll be some days a bit higher, but if we take the average over our hottest week, um, it's going to be five millimeters per day. If you are um, further north, maybe Collingwood or Eastern Ontario, uh, we'll bring that down a little bit. And based on the historic data, we might use four and a half millimeters per day, or perhaps even four millimeters per day. Um, we're going to work through determining the plant water requirements. And this is a process outlined in the BC Trickle Irrigation Manual. It's chapter three. I highly recommend this text. Um, and it's available from the Irrigation Industry Association of BC. So if you Google IABC, um, yeah. And we got a motor along here. So this looks like a lot of stuff. And the good news is we're not gonna go through the full calculation. We're gonna do a simplified version. So we're gonna take out the soil storage factor and we're going to take out this soil storage factor area here. And because the soil storage factor and the system efficiencies in Ontario, they essentially cancel each other out in most cases. So we're just gonna go with a simplified method um, to give an, us an approximate idea about how much uh, water we need uh, for hops in Ontario as a starting point. So our simple formula is the liters per plant per day that your plants are consuming, if they have water available to them, that is, is your evapotranspiration in millimeters, your daily, the area that your plant occupies, so that's in meters squared, at times a crop factor, either called the K or the KC. And so, in our example, um, we're gonna say we've got five acres of hops. The key things here, the spacing is five by 12. Um, 
And we'll come later that we need to know what our emitters are putting out. So in this example, uh, the drip emitters are 1.9 liters per hour and they're spaced every three feet. So I'm gonna run through this example, but know that your system will be different because your emitters may have a different flow per hour and they may have a different spacing. Very common would be one and a half feet, 18 inches, um, sometimes three, it depends. All right, so let's talk about hop. So if we're looking at the hop yard from above, okay, this is not awesome, but anyway, here's our, uh, our rows are 12 foot spacing and uh, between each plant is three feet. And we know that the pops are gonna kind of look like this. The canopy is actually not occupying that full 12 by three. If we were looking at an old apple orchard, for example, each tree would be occupying that full space. The canopy would be completely occupying that space. And the reason I wanna talk about this is that um, we're really, the bigger your canopy, the more water use you're going to have. And at the same time, in hops, although it looks like we don't have a lot of canopy here, we are going to be competing with the grass in our alleys. And we have to consider the height of, um, of this plant and that it's um, receiving a lot of solar radiation. Although this space is empty, it, that solar radiation is being intercepted all the way down the plant. And so we are still having um, a fair bit of canopy uh, that is evapotranspiring. And so um, we are gonna talk about reducing down that 12 by three feet. So we'll come to that. Crop coefficients. So initially when we have uh, the small plants, we just go to the next picture, you can see uh, here the plant is sprouting in April and getting larger over the season. And so um, I've sort of tried to match up the FAO uh, crop coefficient periods with the different periods. And basically we're gonna use 0.3, which they suggest um, through May and June. In June, it's a bit tricky. And you know, in that sort of mid, mid area, you may want to go up with sort of an intermediate crop coefficient, maybe 0.6. This is where the art comes in, not just the science of understanding irrigation. But when we're in that flowering and development of cones, that's when we're gonna be in the 1.05 as our crop factor. Uh, and then reducing down at the end. And to be honest, I don't have a ton of experience with hops, um, but uh, this would be very similar to any other crop, uh, whether it be grapes or tomatoes, etc. You have a crop coefficient that increases as your canopy size increases. So back to our simplified um, calculation. So you might wanna write this one down. Your liters per plant per day is equal to your evapotranspiration in millimeters times your area in meters squared times your crop coefficient. And in Ontario, most of you are gonna be in areas where your peak ET is probably around five millimeters. Uh, your plant area, a typical one I understand is three by 12. So it's 36 feet squared, and then just convert that into meters squared. So if you have a different, you might have a different spacing, be sure to use the spacing that you have in your hop yard. So in this example, we're using 3.3 meters squared. And we're looking at the peak, so that's when our hops are big and um, as big a canopy as they're gonna get. So we're gonna use that 1.05. So if we go through and multiply that, we get 17 liters per plant per day, so a lot of water in that peak time. So if we're not getting rainfall that's supplying those hop uh, vines, uh, then we need to supply 17 liters per plant per day. So like I said, um, we might consider reducing that because we know that the plant is not occupying that full three meters squared. Um, and you could go potentially maybe as low as half of of this amount, but we have to be cautious and we'll come uh, in the second part of the talk uh, about uh, how we can verify if we're putting on too much or too little. Okay, so now if we know what we want to put on, um, then we can, um, we can figure out how long we need to run our system. 
So in this example, we're going to take, or so the formula is our liters per plant per day that we need to supply, and we divide it by the number of emitters per plant times the emitter flow rate. So the number of emitters per plant is our plant spacing divided by the emitter spacing. Let's see if I got this right. Oh yeah, good, okay. I just couldn't remember if I fixed the example. So in our case, our um, plant spacing is three feet and we're dividing by the emitter spacing. So there's one emitter for every plant. And the emitter flow rate in our example, and maybe different from your farm, is 1.9 liters per hour. So we take the amount that we need to supply on that hottest week of the summer, our 17 liters per day. And in order to find out how long to run our system, we divide by the flow that's coming from all the emitters that are supplying that plant. So in this case, it's one emitter times the flow rate. And we know that we need to supply nine, we need to run the irrigation system for nine hours per day. So with scheduling, we can do a ratio. If we know our peak runtime, which was the nine hours and what the peak ET is, and we know that today it's warm, but maybe it's very cloudy, then we can find out what today's operating time should be. So it's a matter of using a ratio. So if we know the peak is nine hours, our peak ET is five, but today it was cloudy. We're only having two millimeters. Maybe it was cool. Then we do a ratio. We find out when the ET is two millimeters, we only need to run for just under four hours per day. All right, I'm gonna pause for a minute if there are questions and I'm gonna check what time it is. So we don't really have any questions yet in the chat. We do have a, a general one we can maybe do at the end about um, uh, just um, irrigation tactics for first year hops. So just yep. hops just planted. Um, but maybe let's let's address that actually. Um, oh. I'm going to whoop. Okay, so the big dif difference between with the first year hops is they're never going to get super big. Evan, how big would they be? Um, sometimes you might get a meter to two meters high. Um, it, it all depends on the size of the plants that are being planted. So if they're a hop start, like uh, from a plug, you might get a meter height. Uh, of growth or so in the first and, year. And will they flower in the first year? Uh, you might have a few flowers, like you might get a, a few cones per plant, handful of cones per plant. So my thinking is that, um, you know, as a, as a start, you probably want to be something less than your full K factor and probably more than the initial 0.3. I use um, 0 0.2 even for bare ground, bare ground. So, you know, you're wanting to look at using a K factor of something when it, they're that meter or so, uh, you're probably gonna use a K factor, something like 0 0.6, I would say. Um, so same idea, you're still gonna use the same formula. Your liters per plant per day is your evapotranspiration, just the same as anybody else in that county. And your area, um, here you could, this is sort of where you can play off the two factors. You can either reduce the area that the plant is occupying, or you can reduce your K factor, or potentially you can reduce both. So I would recommend uh, putting in a smaller K factor, something like 0.6, and, um, and still using your, your full area. You might, you might reduce the area a bit as well. But um, the other thing to note is um, with a new planting um, here, when we estimate, we know how much liters per plant per day each plant is using, smaller than a fully mature hop uh, vine. Um, but you might have less emitters per plant. So for example, if I have my uh, vine spaced at um, five feet and I have uh, one emitter at every foot. So normally with a mature plant, I can assume that that has a wide root area and your that, that plant is accessing water from all five emitters. Uh, with a new planting, we know that the root mass will not be as extensive. And so we're, we have to be cautious to keep in mind that you're actually probably only getting water from maybe two emitters. So that would be another little thing that we have to consider. So let's say we've, you know, we're, we're working with this example. We decided that 
our peak uh, week, we need to run nine hours per day. How can we tell if we're if that's right? If we're doing uh, enough, too much, or too little? So let's talk about soil moisture monitoring. Rebecca, um, yeah. Could I yeah. just just before yeah. you go on to that, could yeah. I could I also maybe ask you to expand on uh, the scheduling for for new hops uh, for first year hops um, in terms of frequency again because sure. they have smaller root mass um you know they might not be able to forage for water as as well as mature hops should you be irrigating say every day versus say every other day or or what have you for your for your so schedule? for all hops whether they're new plantings or existing plantings i would recommend irrigating every day where you have drip irrigation which i think most do you could go to every other day if you know, for some reason, that's a preference. I don't see any problem. Um, every third day is starting to stretch it out. The okay. advantage of drip irrigation is that we can give the plants what they need to drink every day. And this avoids stress. Um, there are some plants for which stress is a benefit. Uh, I think about grapes, for example. Um, they're one of the ones that um, can actually benefit from quite a bit of stress. But for most of our production, we don't want to see stress. Stress is going to be negative to our yield. Um, and so irrigation every day. And even more important with a new planting that we're going to be irrigating every day because they don't have that uh, big root air mass. Um, so with regular uh, established plantings, I would say every day or every other day. Uh, with new plantings, definitely every day. Great, thank you. Yeah, no problem. So uh, we'll talk about soil moisture instruments. Um, you can use either an instrument that's portable, so you're going around taking spot measurements, or something that gets buried and you're uh, logging that, uh, that information. Um, the tensiometer is uh, sort of the classic instrument. Um, it's the it's the reverse of the atmometer that I showed before. So here we have the water column and down here we have the porous ceramic tip. So you're inserting that into the soil with a good contact with the soil. And the cool thing about a tensiometer is it's measuring a real physical thing. So as the water gets drawn out from that ceramic tip out into the soil and out into whatever plants are there, in this case spinach, then you're going to generate a vacuum and that's what's going to show on this little dial. And, um, you know, when I did over the years, when I've done soil moisture monitoring, some folks have said, I, I love the tensiometer. I understand what it's telling me. I walk my field every day. I read the dial. Great. Most growers these days, they don't want to do that. They would rather have um, something where they're getting it electronically transmitted to their cell phone. So it's up to you. Um, I do find that I have preferred uh, an instrument which the data is being logged. So here is an example of an, a different tensiometer, which is electronic, and it's going to this unit, which is then transmitting the information up to the cloud that you can then get on your phone. Here's another example. These are electrical resistance blocks. Um, this is a capacitance type probe, which is uh, put in and um, again, being transmitted to, uh, to the cloud. So here's the instrument here. Um, this is another one. This is a profile probe. It also goes into an access tube. Uh, in this case, we were um, uh, measuring at different points, but it can also be inserted and left in one place. Um, this was kind of my favorite. It's, um, there are lots out there, but this one happens to be sold by Hoskin Scientific. Um, it's by a company called Meter. And uh, their um, loggers are about $1,000 and their probes are about $300. Um, I like to put, oops, I, I usually like to put two probes in, a shallow and a deep probe. So here, whoops, just got a bit of lag here, sorry. So um, the next thing I'm going to show here is a graph. And this is actually, um, this is grapes in a very sandy gravelly soil. And so um, these gray bars are the rainfall and the rainfall scale is over on this side. So you can see quite a few 
uh, rainfalls in that summer. This is 2014 data um, above 15 millimeters. So, and then the green is the uh, soil moisture in uh, a volumetric water content. So it starts off and you can see each day um, that at night, the soil moisture is flat. And then during the day, it steps down. So you get those nice uh, stair steps, which is what we wanna see. And when it rains, you can see the soil moisture goes up. So um, this is so moisture instruments working well in this at this particular site. Um, because it's a sandy gravelly soil, we get a really big uh, drain draining effect right after those big rainfalls. And when we start to see those stair steps start, that's when we would assign that's what we think our field capacity is. That's how much water our soil can actually hold. In a sandy soil, it's going to be after about 24 hours. And in this case, it's quite a low number. It's about 12%. And I do a very unscientific method of saying the permanent wilting point is half of your field capacity. That's not exactly right, but that's kind of where we start with. Um, and then you can start to see that as the soil is drying out, the stair steps get smaller and you sort of see this curve flattening out. And so maybe the permanent wilting point is a little bit higher than that. Um, our irrigation trigger is going to be for drip about 80% of the space between these two lines, between your permanent wilting point and your field capacity, the max that the field can hold. So here's another example. And it's just gonna take a minute, there we go. So in this case, it's just a little bit busier graph because we have the light green line, which is our 12 inch probe and our dark green line, which is a probe down at 24 inch below the soil. So two feet below. And this is also in grape. And so the, the purple arrows show where the farmer irrigated. So the first irrigation is below, you can see that our soil moisture at the 12 inch has gone below what I would consider our trigger point. So maybe the farmer lost a bit of an opportunity here to start irrigating sooner. And um, then, you know, I think these are pretty good right here in the middle. And then near the end of the season, we can see that when they're irrigating, uh, we're getting a response at the shallow probe, which is what we want to see. We want to know that when we're irrigating, we're irrigating sufficiently that we're getting a nice wetted ball um, and that we're uh, getting water coming down to that probe at the 12 inches. Um, but at the end, we also see that we are getting a bit of a response down at that 24 inch probe. So for this particular grower, I recommended reducing the length of time that he was irrigating and potentially adding more frequent irrigations so that we're not getting water draining down to that 24 inch point. So that's the cool thing with soil moisture instruments is that it kind of gives us x-ray vision that we can see into the soil uh, of what's actually going on. So um, that sort of wraps up what I've got. I could talk forever about irrigation. Um, I've got a series of videos. Um, so if you, um, you can go on this link, or if you just Google irrigation Omanafra, um, you should come up with my page. Um, and this, uh, the first video is about um, maintaining your drip systems. And there's one in there about uh, soil moisture. There's three, a series of three about soil moisture monitoring. And they're all really short. They're all less than five minutes. We also have a fact sheet and uh, about monitoring soil moisture. Um, there are other, lots of other things I'd like to talk about. One of them is having a water meter. So I definitely encourage if you've got an irrigation system, you need to be um, tracking how much water you're using. So use a water meter. And, and all of the resources related to irrigation can be found on my page on the website, which is, can be found usually by Googling irrigation Omafra. So I'll open it up for questions now. That's great. Thank you very much, Rebecca. And we'll have to have you back to talk more about yes. other uh other areas of irrigation. So uh, we do have another question in our chat and um, it says, what time of day works best to water in the morning, afternoon or evening? So with drip irrigation, it doesn't really matter. I know some people think it's good to water early morning because then you're moistening up the soil um, for the plant to be using during the day. But um, if you're it doesn't, I don't think there's really any strong evidence that you need to irrigate at a certain time of day. If you were overhead irrigating, 
you don't, you want to avoid evening because then you've got wet foliage all overnight. Um, and, but I, I understand that, um, you know, overhead irrigation would probably be um, not recommended for hops anyways, because of the disease issues. Yes. Yep. You want to have other good. questions on that? Yes. So there's a couple other questions that are popping up in the chat yeah. here. Um, so uh, the first one is our irrigation pond is very low due to the lack of snow and rain. Uh, if we buy a load of water, 25% volume of the pond, and the water comes from a, a municipal source with chlorine, will that affect or kill our pond? No, it's not strong enough. Okay. Um, and uh, next question is, what are the key telltale signs that I am either under or over watering? Oh, that's a good question. If you can see that your plant is wilting, then you've waited too long. So it's important to have a concept about what your schedule should be and be monitoring your soil moisture before you can see those visual signs. Um, one of the challenges is that some of the things we see can occur both at with too much water and too little water. Um, but um, yeah, you. I would recommend that you use some method, even if it's not like a, a, an expensive soil moisture instrument, dig a hole and just feel with your hand and see how, you know, is there moisture there? Um, have a look, how far is the water spreading? Are, are your, is that drip um, making, are those circles joining all along, along your row? Um, that, that's a good way without a lot of expense to to get that extra revision is to actually dig a hole into the soil. And uh, it's good you brought that up too. In terms of wilting of the plants, we've actually seen in hops and particularly younger hops, first or second year hops, um, in the summer, uh, we will get the tips starting to, to die back. Um, and uh, it really does affect the affect the plants, uh, especially when they're when they're smaller. So um, you, you can get wilting and I don't know for hops particularly, but for other crops, you can get wilting during the day when it's just so hot that the, the plant itself can't keep, keep up, even though there's water available. Mm -hmm. um, but I really caution that you should not wait until you see a physical evidence of moisture deficit to to start your irrigation or to increase your irrigation. You'd like to be ahead of that. Okay, great. We don't have anything else popping up in the chat. Uh, one question I do have though, regarding the uh, BC trickle irrigation manual. Yeah. Is, is that available online for download? Is, it a, is there a price for it as well, do you know? It's, it's you can order it from IABC. It's about $50 and I can't remember if they include shipping or not, but uh, yeah, it's about 40 or $50 and then $20 to have it shipped to you. But it's, okay. it's really useful. If you're irrigating, I highly recommend it. Not that I want to promote their publications instead of ours, but yeah. it's a really good one. All right. Uh, we did have one more question just pop up here if you have time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do. Okay, so the question is, you mentioned less than five millimeters is considered nothing, really. How do we calculate rainfall versus how much water the hops are getting? Great, so um, great question. If you have a rainfall of five millimeters and then the next day is hot and sunny and you know that your evapotranspiration is around five millimeters, well, then they're kind of gonna cancel each other out. So you can kind of do a checkbook, sort of balance type of approach. Five millimeters isn't really much. Anything less than five millimeters, we can kind of ignore that it, we can imagine it didn't really happen. Um, but over that, like, let's say I get a small rainfall of 10 millimeters. Well, then I might not irrigate for two days if I'm at my peak. Maybe if I'm not at a peak, like let's say um, I've, I've checked and I know that my ET is about three millimeters for those three days. Well, then I would wait three days before I irrigate again. So again, it's sort of that checkbook approach. Maybe we get a really heavy rainfall though. Um, let's say it was 50 millimeters. Well, I know that a lot of that actually ran off because I, you know, it all came in one day and whatever. So um, that's where a soil moisture instrument can be helpful because again, it gives us that x-ray vision to see how much actually went into the soil. 
but you know, your typical one inch rainfall, like if you get 25 millimeters and it came relatively easily, then you're going to, you're going to do that sort of checkbook approach where then you're going to, you're going to delay irrigating for the amount of time that you got that, uh, those millimeters of rainfall. And because it's all in, um, the height of rain, then the height of the evapotranspiration, you can just do the checkbook approach. All right. Well, thank you again so much, yeah, Rebecca. Yeah. We really appreciate you joining us today. And uh, for those who may have joined us a little bit later, just so you know, we are recording uh, the presentation here and we will be posting it to the blog. Uh, so you can access um, this presentation afterwards. We did also have a request about the slides and uh, we talked about that a little bit before the presentation. So Rebecca might be able to provide us with her slides that we can uh, post with the video as well. So uh, hopefully everyone will have access to that so they can uh, refer back to it. So okay. again, thank you very much, Rebecca. Yeah, you're welcome. And um, I think I'm going to, if you could stop sharing stop your screen. Sharing. Yep. <laughs> That's great. We'll pass it over to Melanie to give uh, an IPM scouting update. Okay, let me just share my screen. Get it up here. Okay. Right. Um, Evan, are you seeing my notes pages or are you seeing just my? Uh, see your full slide, so you're good to go. Perfect. Okay. So I'm going to just change because I think I'm hoping I'm still recording this video. And I'm going to just. It looks like you are. Fix the screen so that I'm not displaying everybody else on there. All right, so I uh, have a few slides presented, but we really wanted uh, Rebecca to fill this time as much as possible because you don't normally hear from her and you hear from us all the time. But I'm gonna just do a brief uh, IPM update. And I think I may scroll through some slides to be cognizant of the time. So we said that we do sort of a general scouting and IPM presentation, but it's mainly to, uh, to talk to you about our IPM training. So those of you who've been growing for a while will recall that Evan and I uh, run in HOPS IPM training workshops and we've started doing that every other year. So the last time we did that was in 2019. So we're due to do a training session in 2021, but of course with, uh, with COVID restrictions still in place, we can't do a live session. Uh, so what we're going to be doing is doing a series of pre-recorded presentations. So it's general IPM training for those of you who have not seen it. It's how to scout a hop yard, looking at how to scout specifically for major hop pests, some abiotic disorders, and hop growth stages. And those will be posted on the On Specialty Crops blog. So I have the link up there. And there, um, that's hopefully going to be up. I'm hoping mine will be up by the end of this week. I, Evan has a couple to do, so I don't wanna speak for him, but we'll have at least a few of them up. Uh, and they will be uh, either YouTube video links or PowerPoint presentations. So just to touch on that briefly, uh, my hazelnut ones I've posted up here just so you can see. So you'll get a link on the blog and it, it, if it's videos, it would take you to a YouTube channel that we have for all of our IPM training that the OMAFRA staff have done. And it'd be a, just a series of regular videos. But what I am experimenting with this year is doing it instead of YouTube videos as PowerPoint presentations. The reason I'm gonna do, or I'm hoping to do that is that would be directly linked into the blog. Uh, and so when you click on it, it would automatically start playing. But what is nice about this feature for those of you who are really experienced and don't wanna listen to the whole thing is that as it pops up, you would get these little links in the lower left-hand corner. I've indicated that here with the, the red square. And if you click on this particular icon with the, that I've highlighted with the red square, what that will get you to is a slide, uh, slide sorter feature. And it shows all the slides and you can just scroll down to whichever slide you want or whichever pest you want and click on that and it will take you directly to that, which we found is quicker and easier than when you're doing uh, videos and you have to kind of slide the scroll bar back and forth. So the only reason we might not post it as this format is if our blogs 
uh, uh, memory cannot take all the presentations, which I'm a little bit concerned about, in which case it will be posted as YouTube videos because it's hosted on a different site. So if you see YouTube videos and you're more interested in this format, send me an email and we can uh, request, send the presentation to you uh, through WeTransfer. So just as a heads up, both of those options should be available, but I'm not sure which one will be posted to the blog. Okay, so I won't spend a huge amount of time. I have a number of scouting, um, scouting slides, but we'll go through them really quickly. This is just my plug for scouting hops. So I find when I talk to growers, you know, you get really, really busy. There's a lot to do. And so the scouting becomes just what you see when you're out doing other things. So just kind of a reminder that dedicated scouting is really key to effective IPM and to using your pesticides uh, in a cost-effective fashion and minimally as, as minimally as you possibly can, because it's giving you that objective summary of your crop conditions. If you are out there just doing other things and you're relying on that as you're scouting, then you are going to be zeroing in on problems because that's what one does. And it doesn't give you that overall summary of what's going on in the field. And you want to make your pest management decisions based on the average level of pests in the field and not just because you see one particular buying that's heavily affected by a pest. So it's that system, systematic monitoring of your pests in association with weather conditions and other things going on uh, associated with the crop stage. And the other reason to do that is to get that experience with your crop from year to year, because it really helps you make decisions and get to know what is normal for your crop and what is abnormal so you can, can sort of diagnose those problems early. So this is all covered in the scouting video, which I will be posting to the blog later on this week, hopefully. But in a nutshell, you're, when you're scouting, what you want to do is divide your hop yard into manageable sections based on your acreage, variety, and age, and scout them separately. Especially if you can't do variety by variety, then just the aroma hops versus your bittering hops. Um, you know, because they tend to have different pests. And certainly ages, younger hop yards will have different pests than older hop yards. So dividing it up as best you can based on that. And then walking the yard, uh, catching both the, the perimeter and the interior of the yard and walking it a random path through the hop yard and stopping at specific plants. And so that's the key thing is that you are pre-selecting specific plants to stop at rather than stopping where you see a pest. So when you get to those plants, so uh, this is sort of the generic procedure. You're going to want to do this at least once a week, ideally at the same time each day. Start by stepping back and doing an overall scan of the hop yard. And then you randomly select plants that you're going to stop at across rows uh, at, for a closer look. But as you're going, you are looking for hot spots by which where you do see a problem. You do want to stop there. You want to note those problems. You want to flag them and examine them each week to see if they're spreading. But you wanna make sure though that you've selected some random plants and, and those random plants will differ from week to week to get these average numbers across the yard. And when you get to those plants, you're gonna to wanna to scout three areas, this, the base, the bottom of the plant, the middle sort of your eyesight and then as high as you possibly can reach. Uh, and, then, and for that, you may need a pole pruner if you're gonna do spot samples of cones, things like that later on in the season, but focusing on the lower portion of the plant because that's where a lot of the problems that you have start. And then um, I will go through in more detail in that scouting video what you're looking for, but just to bear in mind that for some of our pests such as mites, which are really critical pests and aphids, those ones are really best caught by doing uh, sampling the leaves and doing specific counts. Not necessarily of every single mite on the leaf, but certainly at low populations, you wanna be getting a sense of whether you're dealing with one or two or a hundred because there's, there's thresholds that we have that will tell you if you only have one or two, you don't necessarily need to go in with a spray, but when you're above say 15 or 20, then you might. So you can go to the scouting video for more detail, but I want to talk about scouting at a minimum because when I go through the scouting video, we'll talk about sort of ideal numbers. And sometimes that's just too much if you are a grower and you are trying to do this scouting yourself. So just this is something that I talked about last summer. Uh, scouting at a minimum is what we're doing in Simcoe. We're looking at 25 plants in the yard and we're just looking at five leaves per plant. 
And then we collect one leaf for plant and we look at that under the microscope. You can do that with a high magnification hand lens right there in the field to count the numbers of mites and aphids we see on the plant. And we're emphasizing more our frequent casual monitoring. So this is not necessarily ideal because the more stops that you make, the more you can divide up across varieties, the better the results you get. But at a minimum, this is what we've been trying to do at Simcoe. I talked about thresholds. Uh, thresholds are the point at which a above that pest density or population, it becomes uh, economically viable to spray. Below that, the cost of spraying would exceed the, co the cost from damage from the pest. So we do not have any thresholds for our diseases. Our disease fungicide sprays are all preventative. So really what you're doing when you're out there is just monitoring for presence and absence because for some of them, uh, it's going to allow you to know like you, you want to start spraying as soon as you see the pest. And it's also to look at spray efficacy and make sure that your sprays are working, that you're getting good coverage, that your fungicides are not developing resistance. So that would be mostly presence absence. For insects, that's those thresholds are based on average per leaf. And I should stress that we don't have any scientifically established thresholds for insects on hops in the Northeast. So they're either adapted from the Pacific Northwest or based on experience with other crops. But the key ones that people ask me about when should I spray would be for mites, leafhoppers, and Japanese beetle. For mites, that would be uh, in sort of divided by season in June through early July. The threshold they use in the Pacific Northwest is only one to two mites per leaf. After mid-July, it's five to 10 mites per leaf. That's something you can use as a guideline, but you're going to want to adapt that as you get more experience with your crop. And certainly if you are an organic grower, you may have to use a lower threshold because the products that are available are less effective typically than conventional products. For leaf hoppers, an average threshold that is used is two per leaf based on other crops. Again, that's based on experience. Japanese beetle is based more on personal judgment. And I should mention that we don't have anything specifically registered for Japanese beetle on hops, but we do have some products registered on other pests that will have efficacy against Japanese beetle. So this is just an overview that I've presented uh, from time to time about the main primary pests that, that are occurring in hops. And this is from Michigan and sort of when you would see activity, this would be a little bit, a different for Ontario, but our main pests are listed here. I just want to touch on very briefly what you would be looking for right now in the hop yard. So for diseases, you're going to be obviously looking for downy mildew. I'm going to touch a little bit on downy mildew if there's time. Uh, there might not be, but um, downy mildew, we talked about last month, you're looking for basal spikes, but you're also now going to start to look for foliar infections. So that would be those lesions on the leaves. At this time of year, you might start to see wilts from verticillium. If you have that in your soil, that's a bit less common. Fusarium canker and viruses I've put in italics. We often see fusarium canker and viruses show up a little bit later in the season after you've had prolonged wet weather for your fusarium or after it gets really hot and the plants start to get stressed with viruses. But if the weather flips and we're about to have some hot temperatures and the plants start getting stressed now, then you might start to see some symptoms of those, uh, those coming up soon. I've added a new disease for this year that's gonna be added into the hop IPM training. I've talked about it at some of our on hoppings. It's the diaporth, which is that uh, fungus that they started reporting in Michigan and Vermont that we found in Ontario just last year. And it's going to start with some browning of the leaves uh, and will transition to the cones. We don't exactly know when that will start, but you should be starting to look for that now. And I am going to be scouting for it in hop yards this summer. So I will be posting to the blog when I see it. So if you see a post from me, then you're going to want to go out in your hop yard and look for that. For insects, um, I have a number of insects that may or may not be active in the yard. So for aphids, mites, and leafhopper, those tend not to roll into the yard at damaging levels until mid-June, but it's very weather dependent. So if it's hot, then aphids will start building early as will mites. But at this point in time, you're going to want to start looking for them, but just be aware that you're less likely to see the damage and you're more likely 
to see only the, the mites or the aphids themselves. So that means you've got to be flipping leaves over, looking at the underside with a high magnification hand lens, looking for the actual individual insects. But this is really an ideal time to be doing that because you want to catch them when you're finding the insects. The damage is much more obvious and tends to appear in mid-June, but by the time you see the damage, it's often too late to apply a spray, or it's not necessarily too late, but it's, the sprays are less effective. Leaf hoppers tend to roll into hop yards when surrounding hay fields are cut. So we will start to see them late May, early June, sometimes not until mid-June. But at this time of year, you want to start looking at the perimeter of the yard and you're mainly going to see adults. You're not going to see damage and you're less likely to see nymphs until later on in June. You can, if you can't get out into the hop yard really regularly, put out sticky traps on the outside of the hop yard uh, just to catch them entering in the yard. And this would be the time to do that because you just want to catch them when they're moving into the yard. That's the, the best time to look for them. Rose chafer was on the Michigan slide. We have seen that in Ontario, but not to the degree that they've seen it in Michigan. It's very patchy only in certain yards, but it's earlier than Japanese beetle. So Japanese beetle, you're not gonna see probably till mid to late June, but Rose chafer, you may see uh, about uh, early June or very end of May. Other less uh, important pests, but ones that you might start to see now would be flea beetles. And I'm mentioning flea beetles because you typically don't see the flea beetles. They move really, really fast. They tend to be at the base of hop vines and they cause these bullet shaped holes in the leaf. So all these photos will be in the scout training that I'll be posting. Um, you may start to see caterpillars hatching and doing some very minor feeding damage. But if you see jagged holes in the leaves and no insect present at this time of year, and it's sort of constrained to the lower portion of the bind, then likely that is slug or cutworm damage. And if you want to confirm if that's what it is, the best time to scout for slugs and cutworms is actually in the evening. So if you see a lot of feeding damage, lower portion of the bind cannot find insects, you can dig around in the soil during the day to look for them. But you might want to consider heading out into the hop yard at dusk or a little bit later, and that's when they usually are out on the leaves. So that's a sort of a good uh, cue if, you, if you're really having trouble figuring out what's damaging your plants because you can't find the insect, that's, the, that's a good time to look is out at night. So that puts us at one. I just want to be mindful of time. So I'm going to end the slideshow now. Um, I could touch on downy mildew, but I have already uh, touched on that. Uh, really, just with downy mildew, if you haven't started your weekly fungicide sprays or your, your fungicide sprays in advance of rain every seven to 10 days, you really should be starting to do that about now as it's warming up. Uh, and as, when, as certainly once it's rainy, you really want to be getting those fungicide sprays on because they're preventative only. So you need to, to get it onto the plant before it starts raining and the spores start flying. So with that, I will stop my sharing. All right, so kind of related to Melanie, I'll just mention this for those who haven't seen it in the chat. You were asked about uh, the uh, pest control product uh, list that you always post each year, you update it each year. So um, Melanie said that she will be getting that posted, uh, hopefully either this week or next week. Um, and in the meantime, the 2020 list from last year, it is available on the blog and it's also available on the OMAFRA website on the Growing Hops in Ontario landing page. Um, so both, both. Yeah, both. and that's why it, it hasn't come out as early because we've actually, this is the first year I think since I started with OMAFRA that we haven't had a new product in the last year. So the 2020 list is, there'll be minor tweaks to the labels, uh, but for the most part, it still stands. We are expecting a fungicide to become registered uh, late season, but it's not available yet. So there's check, I'll post it to the blog shortly, uh, but if we get this new product a little bit later, it, I'll repost it with the new fungicide added later in the season. All right. That's it. I don't know um, if we have- I don't see any other questions. questions in the blog or in the, <laughs> in the mm -hmm. chat. Um, I know we are over time now, uh, but if there are any questions, please feel free to unmute and ask or post them in the chat and we can uh, 
either address them now or uh, put up a posting on the blog to address them or look into them for next the next meeting. Thanks guys for attending. We appreciate we appreciate all the thanks too that's going on in the chat. It, it's nice to know that um, these are helpful. And again, if there's topics that you're looking for specific information, please let us know. Uh, either Melanie and I could address it or we can bring in a guest speaker like uh, like we did today with Rebecca to talk uh, you know from their own expertise. So oh uh, Evan, before people sign out, we should probably touch on our format for next month for our uh, the Q and A, the video. Do you want me to? Yes. Yeah, so to yeah, sure. Go ahead. Okay. So I think we we have we're skipping a month with the live sessions for next month, I believe. Is it? Yeah, because then, then we'll come back in July, uh, just because people get really busy. So we tend to have our attendance drop in June. But what we're we're experimenting with this year is doing a pre-recorded Q and A. So you guys can email us our, any questions you might have as you're going in the yard and and uh, encountering anything. Email them to us, and I think we'll post to the blog the deadline for emailing us those questions. And then Evan and I will pre-record. That, uh, the answers to that in a, in a Zoom video. I was trying to figure out our format and we'll post that on the blog. And that'll, I might be slides or it might be us out in the hop yard um, and recording things. And then we'll post it to the blog with the, with the answers. And if we don't get any questions between now and I think it's mid June that we made our deadline, then we will just not post anything for June and then we'll resume again in July. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Evan? No, I think that that's great. Um, I did want to revisit one last thing on one of your slides. You're saying uh, you're we're doing about 25 plants uh, in the hop yard here for scouting um, at in the Simcoe station. Mm -hmm. um, and just to give people an idea of the size of the hop yard, in case uh, the research yard, if you haven't visited it before, it's about three quarters of an acre. So uh, gives you an idea of the the size of that yard, and then and Melanie was saying we're doing about twenty five plants uh, for the scouting protocols there. So that that kind of gives gives that idea. Um, yeah, and I should say if you can't manage that, but you can manage ten, do that. Anything you can do that you can stick with regularly is better than not doing anything at all. All right. Well, we're about. 10 after one. So uh, apologize for going over the, the one o'clock uh, time period there for everyone. But hopefully you found this month uh, valuable. You've hopefully you've taken away some valuable information uh, as we get into the growing season here. And uh, obviously everything's kind of up and growing. And um, yeah, it's uh, the, uh, the forecast here looks like we're going to have quite a few sunny days uh, and warm temperatures ahead. Uh, so we can expect those hops to really be going gangbusters and uh, hopefully you can get your irrigation situation figured out and also uh, get uh, prepared for scouting. So uh, we wish you all the best and we will, we look forward to seeing you guys uh, next month in our, uh, in our different format for the, for June. Take care, Bye, everybody. Everyone.